Hi, welcome to Fiber Chats. My name is Irina. I'm the host here and my guest today from Belgium. We, okay, I'm going to try it. I'm going to do it my best and then you're going to correct me. Van der Reichen. Is it close it's, enough? It's, it's close enough. Just okay, call you me say it. Just You say it. It's, in Dutch, it's Wim van der Reichen. Perfect. Anyway, <laughs> welcome to my channel. Love having you, you here. Um, so I met you on Instagram and like when I go on your Instagram account, it's appear your love for socks becomes immediately apparent. Yes. How did that happen? Like why socks? Um, I'll try to make a long story short. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm very happy that you uh, that you invited me, and I'm very honored because I've seen the list of uh, very big names that have passed by here. So I'm. I'm a, I'm a little humbled that I can uh, be in between all those lovely people. But to answer your question, um, I had been knitting for about seven or eight years. And then I met my big idol, Dennis. He's a, a Dutch guy who had already published eight or nine uh, Amigurumi books. He's a crocheter and a crochet designer. And I was a very big fan of his. He was my idol. He was my, my big uh, crochet guru. And uh, one time we met very, very strangely on a, on a knitting and a crocheting cruise, uh, which sounds very tropical, but wasn't <laughs> that tropical because it was in the Netherlands. And um, we went on a boat ride for three or four hours. We sat across from each other. We talked a lot. And um, Dennis didn't know how to knit. And I had recently took a workshop for sock knitting. And I totally got addicted to the sock knitting um, because it was very intriguing. Uh, not very difficult once you know how the structure of a sock is. Yeah. And Dennis proposed to make a book together. And my first answer was, yeah, sure, of course, let's make a book together. And I thought he wasn't really being serious. No, but wait one kidding. second, one second. But he proposed to write a book with you without even knowing how to knit at that point. He was not a knitter at that point. He wanted to make a book. Well, um, you should know he uh, did publish uh, eight or nine crochet books by that time, and he did know how to crochet very well. But he also knew that you don't have to master a craft to publish a book. Okay. There's always ways to... And if he, if he took me by the hand and said, let's make a book together, and I knew how to knit, that was fine for him. But also he wanted to learn how to knit. And um, that was a very good starting point to make a book because if I could teach him how to knit and we live very far apart, I live in Belgium, he lives in the Netherlands and I could write down everything he should do to learn how to knit. Then we would have a, a perfect base to make a sock knitting book with all the knitting instructions for a beginning knitter. So that's what we did. And that's what I taught him. And now he knits and he immediately started knitting socks. Also because he and I are both very, uh, very big fans of the colorful uh, happy socks. You know, the, the socks right. that are, that are with, the, with the fun colors and the nice prints on them. We thought, why not try and knit them ourselves? So we made a lot of sock designs, some very easy, some a little bit intricate with some fair aisle patterns in them, some with a lot of fair aisle patterns in them and a, a lot of difficulty but we enjoy uh, making them and that's how my love for socks really exploded so uh, once you make a book and people know you for making a book and it's a book about socks then yeah you kind of get stuck with socks well talking about um a book right so you posted this thing where you are standing and there is some sort of like contraption hanging on your wrist uh, oh yeah socks can we talk about that like what's that tool and how did you find it and what how did it happen okay so a few weeks ago um when this gets posted even a few months ago there was a big uh, fair a big yarn and uh, yarn fair in holland in the netherlands and after that i got contacted by the two sisters two swedish sisters who um are trying to start a company they're called the twister sisters and they made or their dad made this contraption for their mother 
who was always uh, losing her balls of yarn. They were always on the floor, around the, the table, around the chair. So um, he made a contraption. And it's funny that you should mention it because it's right here next to me. Uh, it's called a twister. And what it uh, basically is, is, and I'm very happy to show you because I'm, they, they asked me if I would uh, like to help promote the contraption. <laughs> it's funny well, that you call it. We can put the link to it under the video so people can find it. They will love that because they're trying to get their, their business uh, to, to become a, a little bit bigger. So the thing they, they make or the thing they do is uh, this thing. It's sort of an iron bracelet that has uh, yeah this, this little thing on the bottom, which makes this twist around freely, very easily. You uh, disconnect the bottom side so you can take a ball of yarn off, another one on. You push this on again so the ball doesn't drop off. And what's, what this is made for, you just hang it on your wrist and then you can take your knitting project and it will unravel all by itself. So it's basically those... for knitting on the go. Like if you're so standing somewhere or if you're going somewhere, like you can carry it along. Yes, but also when you're sitting down, when you're in the waiting room at the doctor's, at the dentist's office, but also when you're sitting on the couch, because I use I also use this when I'm on the couch. And then obviously it doesn't unravel by itself because it's against me. But if I lift my arm and just pull the arm, it unravels. So okay. it's... In my eyes, it's very revo revolutionary. No, I had very never clever. seen it before. Yeah, I also I also have this little thing. I don't know if you know the yarn holders. Yeah. But if I twist this too fast, it, it kind of makes a weird sound and it starts doing funny things. This never uh, does funny things. This only does what it's supposed to do. So um, yeah, this is a, a twister. It might uh, still have a, a very nice promotion code which I won't mention now, but people can uh, read it in your comment section, I'm, I'm sure. So we'll, uh, we'll discuss that and see if it's uh, still available in January. But um, so that's the twister. So, okay, let's go back to your starting knitting. Like, why did you decide yeah. to start knitting suddenly? That's a very fascinating story, I think, myself, because um, I'm a primary school teacher. Right. So I work with small children. And when I started teaching second grade, I noticed that children aren't uh, very good at fine motor skills anymore. When I was a child, a very, very long time ago, um, my parents always let me do arts and crafts stuff, uh, doing things, cutting, coloring, um, modeling, all kinds of stuff. And children nowadays don't do that anymore. They're often just swiping tablets and smartphones and pushing buttons on computer games and playing outside and doing arts and crafts aren't, aren't their thing anymore. Okay. So I noticed that when, when they should be writing, they don't write as beautifully anymore. They can't cut shapes anymore. It's, it's, very, it's very difficult for children to do that kind of stuff when they don't work with their fingers anymore. So I needed something, uh, a craft, or something to, to teach the children. So I had to learn it for myself first. And then I walked to a local yarn store. I uh, told them I want to learn how to crochet. And they told me, uh, go home and look it up on YouTube. You'll find a lot of tutorials. So I did that. And uh, a few days later, I needed yarn to do what I saw on YouTube. So I went back to the yarn store. Um, before I kn knew it, I was a, a customer there. I was a a regular customer there. Uh, after a year of crocheting, I also picked up knitting because I saw other people coming there making beautiful stuff, making stuff that you can't do in crochet, but you can do in knitting. Right. So I thought, I'm going to learn that too. And I do teach children some yarn related crafts in my classroom, but the real addiction stuck with me. <laughs> <laughs> you got the side benefit of uh, trying to teach some fine motor yeah. skills. Yeah. Um, well, what else did you learn along the way? Like you look at yourself back then, like back seven years back, right? And you look at yourself now. And besides the fact that you now written three books. Yes, right? three uh, books and a little magazine too. Like what was that journey like? When I was younger, when I was a teenager and in my, uh, in my young 20s, I 
didn't have a lot of, how should I put it? Um, a lot of people meditate or do yoga or do other stuff to make them calm down. Well, when you're young, you don't really need anything to calm you down. You're just happy and young and energetic by yourself. But as I grew older, I noticed that it helps me to uh, straighten my thoughts, to uh, make me uh, become more relaxed again. Actually, since I started knitting and crocheting, I uh, wake up half an hour earlier than I used to. So usually I woke up at seven in the morning and now I wake up at uh, 6.30 so that uh, I do my morning rituals and I have my breakfast. And before I go to school, before I leave for work, I still can do half an hour of knitting or crocheting. And that really relaxes me. And okay. when I have a busy morning and I don't have time to do some knitting or crocheting, I really feel uh, anxious and stressed all day. And I, uh, yeah, I feel like something's missing. How much do you usually need per day? Like besides that half an hour in the morning, do you come back and like jump right back to knitting? Like do you knit every single day? Only when I have the time. So uh, when I come home, like for instance, today, I had uh, some report cards to hand out and I had to call a lot of parents to discuss the report cards. So I haven't had time yet, but um you can be sure then that when we finish this interview, I'm on the couch and I'm knitting. So it's approximately an hour or two hours a day. Um, sometimes it's it's three or four hours when I have a lot of time and sometimes it's nearly nothing. So on an average, two hours a day. Do you ever lose your knitting mojo? Do you ever like, just don't feel like touching the needles? Rarely. Uh, when I lose it, it's for one or two days. And then it means I'm or very sick or very busy and very stressed. And when I try to knit when I'm too stressed, then it's, it's very bad. <laughs> then uh, everything goes wrong and I lose my stitches. I do something wrong. I turn my work when I shouldn't turn my work. It's terrible. But um, luckily, it's only one or two days and then I just get it back. I have been wondering that myself if I ever would stop knitting or crocheting. I don't think so. I think this is a passion for life. So you mentioned that you were a regular at that store. How mm -hmm. did your personal stash change from that first visit to the yarn store to where you're now? I think <laughs> I'm, I'm close to owning my own yard store at the moment. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I, always, um, I always say that uh, buying yarn and making stuff with the yarn are two very different hobbies. Right, yeah, and collecting. I'm, I'm, yeah, it's collecting, it's, it's a collection. And I sometimes I need the yarn without knowing what I'm gonna make of it and without even, uh, without even ever going to make something of it. But, but you, sometimes you just need to have it. <laughs> and it's, it's an addiction too, and I'm aware of that. But as long as it doesn't build up a lot of debt, just let me do it. <laughs> right. Well, when you buy yarn, uh, what grabs your attention? Is it the texture of the yarn that you go for? Is it the colors? Like what's the colors? Yeah, it's uh, primarily the colors. And the, the more saturated the colors are, the more I love it. It's something that I've learned uh, over the years. Uh, very dark colors don't do it for me. Uh, very pale colors, so the pastel colors are not my thing. I can use them and I can knit them, but um, as, as you've seen a few minutes earlier, this is a very nice rainbow sock. Uh, I can show you another project I'm working on. Um, don't adjust your TV. This is uh, what it's that. supposed to look like. So it's very bright, very colorful. And when I do that, it, it, just, it just grabs my attention and I want to make very pretty colorful things. And when, when I look at that, it just stimulates me to make more and do other things. I don't, I don't know if you saw properly, but I started with a with a cuff. And I did some uh, some German short row stuff to make these little eyelets. And now I'm going with another kind of ribbing. So I do some variations in the structure, but also uh, the colors just ask me to go on and knit a little more. And now the yellow is coming, so I just knit on. And now the orange is coming, so I just knit on. And I, uh, 
I have some difficulty putting this down when I start knitting. And sometimes I just leave uh, for work a little late because I'm still knitting. <laughs> Had to do one more row. <laughs> yeah, one more row, just a few more stitches. Right. Well, how do you pick the projects? Like, is everything, so you design those socks, but like, do you need everything that you design or do you ever need other designers? Uh, patterns. Oh, I I, uh, I started uh, knitting uh, stuff from other designers. I'm a very big fan of Stephen West. Uh, I want to knit everything he designs, but he designs faster than I can knit. So <laughs> <laughs> it's it's yeah. incredible. The the way he designs is very yeah. It's it's mind blowing to me. I wish I could do the things he does and uh, design the things he does, but. Um, as, as for the books that we uh, made, um, we don't knit everything that's in the books because it's impossible for just us two to knit all the socks in all the sizes that are photographed in the book. So we have a team of uh, very, very, very lovely ladies who help us um, knit all the socks that we need. Some of the socks in the book are, are of my hand, some are knit by Dennis. Um, but yeah, we, we need some support and people who knit for us because otherwise it's impossible to do. So do you have like a favorite pair of socks in that book? Is there something that like you consider your masterpiece? Yes. So we have uh, for the English speaking people, our first book was translated into English and it's called Happily Knitting Socks. Um, but this doesn't contain my absolute favorite pair. My absolute favorite pair was in the second book. And actually the title of the second book was, uh, was decided before we even knew that we were going to make a second book because I uh, called Dennis one day and I told him if we ever make a second sock knitting book, it should be called Sock You Too. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what the title is. So uh, right. we designed Sock You Too. And in this book, there's a sock that I'm particularly proud of. You'll uh, immediately see why, because I just told you that I love colors and this is the I love those. Most colorful sock that's in the book. It's a mix and match sock, so you get the patterns for all the different segments, and you can just mix and match every color and every segment that you want. So that's a, uh, and, and really enough, enough, all the people that are knitting the sock are making it exactly as I did it in the book. So uh, the purpose of the sock is actually to make your own very personal uh, choice sock, but yeah, your, your personal choice, but everyone is just doing what I did. <laughs> Funny. It, you know, I must admit, like up until uh, a month ago, I was absolutely terrified of socks. Like I've needed very difficult lace. I've needed like some complex things. Socks, somehow like the whole idea of sock just terrified me. So eventually two guests of my show, Professor Pearl and Steven Weber were making so much fun of me and my fear of socks that I said, you know what? <laughs> I'll do it. So Professor Pearl gifted me a pattern and I just sat down and I knitted those socks. But like when I see your book and I see your socks, it almost makes me believe that it's it's like doable somehow. It is. Yeah, I'm absolutely convinced that it's doable. But I also understand the fear of people who've never knit socks to go and start knit a sock because it's knitting it's knitting in the round it's knitting a cuff it's knitting a heel which terrifies a lot of people right. and then it's knitting a toe and the most difficult part about knitting socks is when you finish one sock you have to make another one because everybody has right. two feet so um <laughs> there are those very intricate knitters who uh, go two socks at a time or who um, yeah, have other uh, special qualities to avoid the second sock syndrome but our socks are very knittable, very wearable too. The only part that's difficult about knitting our socks is when you go and knit a fair aisle pattern in a sock, because if you do that the wrong way, and the wrong way is just carrying the yarn and making long floats at the back, um, then the sock won't have enough stretch to put your leg in. And since the sock is, is supposed to be very comfortable, um, you need a lot of stretch in the sock so that you can wear it. So that's one of the things that I try to explain. I have a YouTube channel myself and I try to explain in Dutch um, how people should do the fair owl knitting or how I do the fair owl knitting and it uh, leaves a lot of stretch in the socks. Other people can do it in their way. That's, uh, that's fine by me. 
but um, I tried to do some tips and tricks for people to uh, to make their socks a success. Well, do you have a favorite method of knitting socks? Like you mentioned that some people do it two at the time. Like what's your go-to? Are you on the double pins? Are you on the magic loop? Like how do you knit your socks? Well, that's a very difficult question to answer because um, there's only one type of uh, sock knitting that I don't like. And that's uh, the one on the very short circle needles. Mm -hmm. the, the very short needles have very, very, very short needles itself. Right. And me with my my big man <laughs> hands, it's very difficult to just hold them with three fingers on each hand and, and start knitting like this. I, I almost uh, put my pinky up when I'm <laughs> knitting like it because I don't have anything to grab on. But um, when I'm knitting in the round, I can do double pointed needles. I can do a long, um, a long circle needle and just go uh, magic loop or uh, like I'm doing with this sock. It's uh, on the, I think you call them flexi flips. Right. But uh, uh, here they're called the Crazy Trio Needles by uh, Adi, by uh, a brand that's, uh, yeah, it's very famous here in, uh, in Europe. So uh, you only put your stitches of your sock on two needles and you knit with, I almost pulled out the wrong needle there, um, and you knit, knit with the third one. So uh, I think it's a very intricate system, very nice system, but um, don't make me choose because I also have uh, three pairs of socks on uh, circular needles. I also have some on double pointed needles. So I like to change up my game and uh, do well, Let's what I talk prefer. about that. So how many working projects do you have? Let's talk about something else because <laughs> this is a never Not ending bad. story. <laughs> well, are you organized about it? Like, I know like a lot of people who have dozens of uh, whips right so they they have one in each separate bag and then they have like detailed notes on what row they stopped and like what's the next thing are you very organized that way <laughs> i once saw a video of stephen west talking about starting new projects when you feel like starting a new project and uh, I, I saw the light something in me uh, clicked and said yeah he's right if you feel like starting a new project, just do it. And if an old project stays there for a month, for a year, who cares? It's uh, it's not going bad. It's not going anywhere. Maybe it never gets finished. If you feel like doing something else, do what you feel like. And if you don't feel like finishing that particular shawl, even though it's going to be marvelous and amazing and you spent hundreds of dollars on yarn uh, to make it, if you don't feel like finishing it, just keep it there and maybe you get uh, you get the sense of I want to knit it back, and maybe you don't. So I have a lot of uh, single socks, a lot of uh, not even finished single socks. I have a lot of scarves. I have a lot of shawls. I have a lot of other things. Um, yeah. Do you There's ever wear of, different what? socks? Like if you have yeah. single sock of that and single sock of that, would you wear them together? Yes. <laughs> there's a there's the World Down Syndrome Day. Uh, that's one day a year, but I don't mind wearing two different socks. E uh, um, I even, if I knit a pair of socks, I try to make them slightly different. So uh, socks don't have to be twins. They can be sisters, but they don't have to be twins. So like when you write the book, the socks, right? Do yeah. you have in mind the specific audience? Do you like think, okay, I need to put something for absolute beginners. I need to put something for intermediate people. And I need to put something for the experts. Or is it just whatever comes like to your mind as far as design? I can show you the, the beginning of our book has a lot of uh, how to knit. So uh, all the different techniques you need to knit a sock. But then when you, um, when you flip to a page where there's uh, the title of the, of the sock, then there are three little socks. And we just, uh, it just shows if it's one sock, it's a very easy pattern. If it's two socks, it's a little intricate. If it's three socks, it's very, very difficult to knit. Um, so we keep that in mind. But when it comes to designing a, a specific fair owl pattern, we just design what we like. Dennis is a, a graphic designer. So if I say, um, hey, let's make a, a sock with bananas on them, uh, he just whips out a banana pattern and then I start knitting and that's it. So uh, we don't really, think about what's going to work with the audience. 
we do keep in mind that we want everyone to enjoy our book. So it's uh, simple socks with a, an easy self-striping yarn or very uh, difficult socks where you need nine or seven different colors of sock yarn to complete a very nice mountain landscape. It's something for everybody. Right. Well, you mentioned that Dennis was your idol, but before Dennis became your idol, you were actually yourself on the idol <laughs> show. <laughs> And yes, I, discovered I, have been that, idol too. <laughs> I discovered that accidentally while trying to find more information about uh, yeah. you and your sock knitting career. Yeah. Suddenly I saw all these videos of you being on the idol show um, popping yeah. up. How do you decide for yourself now? Because obviously like you're still singing, you're like you're an amazing singer and I actually Thank love you. your songs. Yeah. Um, how do you like balance your interests in life and the job and the your passions how do you decide what you're gonna spend time on and what you're gonna invest yourself into at the, any given day basically well uh thank you for the compliment first of all and um singing has always been a, a part of my life ever since i started taking singing lessons uh, at the music academy so the first two years there was only one option one one um, course that I could take that was classical music so I did enjoy it but it was not really my cup of tea it was not the thing that I wanted to pursue and then after two years uh, they organized another course at the same music academy which was called pop and jazz music I freaked out so I immediately started taking those classes and I really really enjoyed it it was uh, a way for me to express myself to um, become more connected to myself to uh, experience uh, something that I didn't experience before because I knew that I liked music and I knew that I liked singing a bit but now I could explore it and see how, how far I could take it and um, that was something that I really really enjoyed and then uh, all of a sudden there was this uh, new uh, calling for uh, auditions on the, the Belgian version of Idols. And I thought, why not just try it? I actually just wanted to see, because it, this wasn't the first edition in Belgium of the, of the show. There were, uh, had been two previous seasons. Right. And I never believed that all those people were real people. I always thought, you, you, can't, you can't think that you're a singer when you're that terrible at singing, or you can't <laughs> think that you're a singer and, and have parents tell them, this is my daughter and she's an incredible singer. And then you see her sing and you hear her sing and you think, what? <laughs> so I actually wanted to, uh, uh, to enter the competition to go see if the auditions were real. And they are. <laughs> <laughs> so I saw a lot of people, a lot of very, very good singers, a lot of mm, not so good singers, but um, all of a sudden uh, at the audition, they gave me a ticket and they, they told me, see you at the live shows. And then I was very surprised. And I, th then I thought, okay, so I made it to the live shows. Let's see where I can take this. And then I was in a competition and then it got serious. And then I wanted to do my very best. And I can proudly say that I ended up fifth in the competition. So. Um, what was the most difficult part of that competition for you? Um, the most difficult part was that I was a teacher at the time, still am, but I was a teacher. So I had sort of a, how do I, I had to, I had to be a, a singer on TV, but also in the interviews in between and when we were making the show, I still had to, to keep in mind, watch out what you say, watch out what you do, because I like to do some innuendos. I like to make some kinky little dirty small talk. And I had the feeling that I couldn't really do that and be my complete self uh, because what would the parents of school think of me and what would my coworkers think of me? So um, that's something that they told me when I was doing the show. Um, we wanna see more, we wanna see who you are. We wanna, and of course they knew who I was but they wanted to see that on TV. And I was very reserved, I was very, goody two shoes, I'm a teacher, <laughs> let me just sing my song and I'll go home. And that's the part that they missed. And that's the part that I uh, 
feel sad about that I couldn't show them. Now that I'm making books, and now that I'm on the internet a little more, and now that I'm doing lives, and now that I'm doing these interviews, I can say whatever the, the hell I want, and nobody cares. Well, let me ask you about that. So you, when you wrote your first book, mm -hmm. was there any reaction from your students, from the parents of your students about that book? Like, was, was anybody surprised about it? Like, did they not know you oh, were it, a it wasn't a secret that I'm a knitter. They, they knew that I was a knitter and a crocheter. Um, the only reactions were very positive and fun reactions. And the, the best reaction of all was one child, one, uh, one of my students, and you should remember they're seven or eight years old. Um, she had a birthday coming up and she didn't ask for anything for her birthday except for my book. <laughs> and she brought it to school and she, very, uh, she was very shy when she walked up to me and she said, would you, would you please sign my book? <laughs> And it was so endearing. That was that was really lovely. But um, I've never had any wrong or or weird reactions to it. It, it. it just people people tend to accept what you do if you if you act normal about it. Right. Because I think it's very normal. I I like what I do. It's my passion. Now I've made a book about it, and now I can share that passion with the world. That's well, when did you it. feel more of a celebrity moment when you were on that stage or when that girl asked you for the autograph? <laughs> <laughs> That's a difficult one. Um, I, I did feel more special when that girl came up to me and asked me for an autograph because uh, it meant a lot more to me because she was so close to me. That was uh, one of my students that I had been teaching for months. So, um, but also being on a on a big stage on national television that was an experience that i'll carry with me for the rest of my life that was something i wouldn't do it again because i've been there i've done that i've bought the t-shirt i ended <laughs> up fifth <laughs> i think if i do it again i won't do any better so um, just put it in my backpack and carry it with me for the rest of my life but it was a very nice experience I took some uh, I took some time off work to concentrate on those live shows and on that singing competition, so it was it was a good part of my life. Right. I want to ask you about your tattoos. So mm -hmm. first of all, they are just like your socks, very elaborate. It's yeah. not a little quite tiny like butterfly. You have like your arm covered and one of your legs covered, right? And it's very, in, like I was actually zooming in to learn it yesterday. <laughs> it's like really interesting design. How did you come up with that? And do you feel like you're treating your body as the sketching pad, as your like way of decorating yourself? Like why did you decide on do doing those tattoos? It's actually very funny because uh, if you would have told me 20 years ago that I would have a leg and an arm covered in tattoos, I would never have believed you. Um, it all started when I met my boyfriend. It's not his fault that I started <laughs> getting tattoos, but he made me think about getting tattoos. So the first tattoo I ever got was uh, on the top of my foot. And I got a number tattooed from the first movie my boyfriend and I saw together. And he has the same, he already had the tattoo on his ankle. So now we don't have each other's names on our bodies because I think that's a little crazy i don't know I, I would never put someone's name on my body no judgment if you have a name on your body but uh, i would never um but that was some yeah that was the starting point so i uh, i had one tattoo and then i had another and then i had another and then i add something and then uh, something else and then i had another idea and all of a sudden one of my arms and one of my legs is almost completely covered in tattoos which uh, might seem like a big, strong, rough, uh, angry man, but I'm really very cuddly. <laughs> <laughs> also, if you see what I've put on my arm, uh, being a teacher, I have to consider what I put on my body and I, I still wanna be able to go to work, showing my arm, uh, wearing shorts and having uh, children see my leg without being afraid of something. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't put uh, scary demons or skulls on my body. That's that's not my thing. But I, I like geometric patterns. So uh, the things that I put on my body are very geometric. I've got some some triangles. 
I've got some bands. I've got uh, two flowers for my mom who passed away a few years ago. I've got a, a geometric bear here. And the, the craziest tattoo is actually this one. Um, do you know the, the brand Nutella? Yep. The chocolate spread? This is uh, the barcode of a small <laughs> jar of Nutella. <laughs> <laughs> So I wanted a stripey pattern. Uh, I wanted something to fill in uh, the bottom half of my of my lower arm, and um, I started designing something for myself. But I, I couldn't agree on which stripes did I, did I want: broad stripes, narrow stripes, a lot of stripes, not a lot of stripes. So I just figured, let's take something that I really, really like, really, really enjoy, and put that on my arm, and it really scans. So if you have a <laughs> barcode scanner this right. really scans 400 grams of nutella well talking of nutella you make your own right yeah i did it i, I am following uh bengini i think that's his name on instagram and he's a an amazing cook an amazing baker and uh all of a sudden i saw him make his own nutella with only three ingredients some roasted hazelnuts some cocoa powder some uh, some powdered sugar and some salt, four ingredients. That was it. So uh, it was amazing. It was you a like little bit more work, a little bit more work than going to a, <laughs> to a store jar. and buying and buying a jar. But uh, it was very tasty. So I encourage everybody to at least once make your own Nutella. Is that one of your passions to cook? To make? Oh yes, I'm I'm a very uh, passionate cook uh, cook and a baker. So I uh, I enjoy that very much. Uh, I need time to do it. So if I don't have a lot of time, I don't really like to do it. In our third book, funny that you mention it, but in our third book, we also included two recipes. One of my uh, very delicious carrot cake and one of the snickerdoodle cookies that I make whenever I have people over. So these are the cookies. Oh, those look delicious. With the recipe included. And then there's the recipe for my carrot cake you can't really see it all that well, but it has a lot of frosting and that makes everything better. So <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> so you also have your own YouTube channel, as you mentioned. What was the idea of starting the YouTube channel? It was very difficult, uh, very, very easy to decide, but very difficult to do. Um, once we published the first book, a lot of people uh, told us that the book was great and they like the book but some people have difficulty uh, reading something watching at a picture at a photograph and then knowing what they should do not everybody is as good at reading and then doing what a picture shows so i wanted to demonstrate all those people who couldn't just read and do what it says so i needed a youtube channel and there are not a lot of videos on it but they're very useful and they've been uh, watched a lot of times so um, especially the part about the heel, the very difficult, uh, scary part of a sock. And there are a lot of people who watch it and every time they knit a new sock, they just click on the link of my video and just watch it again and watch it again and watch it again, every time knitting another heel on a sock. So that's, that's why I did it. I have a lot of new tutorials that I've filmed already, but I still, they still need some editing. So uh, there will be some new, videos on my uh, new tutorials on my YouTube channel. Sadly, I have to uh, admit that they will all be in Dutch. So oh, one day, we're still hoping one day you'll find time. <laughs> well, if it's, if it's something that will grow and that will get bigger and bigger, then of course I have to, uh, or uh, just dot all the existing uh, right. videos that I have, or just uh, make some new ones for the English. It actually might be a good it. idea to just do the subtitles there. And this way subtitles or just just take the the video footage and speak uh, over them in english and make two different lists of tutorials the dutch ones the english ones and before you know it the germans will knock on my door and uh, <laughs> we brauchen auch videos and then uh, the french will come knocking and uh, pour, pour nous aussi. <laughs> um so you also mentioned to me that you have a Facebook group where you go live every week and it's also yes. in, in Dutch, right? Yeah. Uh, when we started the first book, so the Happily Knitting Socks, then we also started a Facebook group called Happily Knitting Socks. But because the third book that we published isn't about socks, we just 
put the socks out of it and just called the Facebook group Happily Knitting. And we have uh, a nice group of followers there. Uh, the, the total of people following us there are about 5,000 at the moment. But every week when we go live, Dennis and I just do a knitting hour for an hour. We just uh, sit and knit and talk and discuss. Uh, and we see people chatting while we are knitting and uh, we answer their questions. Sometimes the same questions pop up every week. Sometimes we get some very interesting questions. We never prepare anything. Um, maybe we get some new yarn in the mail and then we show what we got. Or uh, when I get the twister, I show them, look at what I've got. And uh, it's a very new system. Sometimes people just ask a question. I turn my camera around. I show them how I knit something, how I cast on, what I do to cast off. So. Um, yeah, it's, it's just a very spontaneous little get together every week. And uh, yeah, we enjoy it. And that's why people enjoy it. Right. Well, what's your vision for the future? Like, do you have, do you plan anything or you just like, whatever's going to happen is going to happen? That's pretty much how I live my life. <laughs> I, uh, I don't really make any plans because if you make big plans and they don't, uh, don't succeed, then you only get disappointed. But um, the way it's going now, it's only growing and it's only getting bigger. And I enjoy that it's getting bigger. With our books, I also get a lot of requests for workshops. So um, people in local yarn stores and not so local yarn stores, stores also um, are asking me to come and give workshops. So I love to teach workshops. I do that also. The thing I don't enjoy about workshops is the hours of driving a car. So I've uh, once told Dennis, um, kiddingly, of course, that I want to become so famous that I can hire a chauffeur for me <laughs> to drive me around to the workshops so I can sit and knit in the back of the car. Um, <laughs> if I ever make that, then I can die a happy man. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you think but the I, fact that you are a teacher in school makes it so easy and so natural for you to teach knitting as yes, well. Yes, I've, I've heard a lot of people uh, tell me at the end of a workshop, thank you for being so patient with me. And I always tell them that's not a problem. That's my job. That's what I get paid for uh, in the day. So um, if people um, don't understand a certain technique, I just look for a way to explain it to them differently. If they um, don't uh, understand it the second time, I just show them what I'm doing. If they don't understand it, then I just grab their hands and make them do it. So it's, yeah, it's, it's what a teacher does. So uh, I just combined the fact that I'm a teacher with the fact that I'm a knitter and I go and teach some knitting classes. Right. Is there like next book in the works already? Yes. <laughs> There's not just one book in the works. There are a few books that uh, are probably on the planning and a few other projects. Of course, I can not tell you anything about them, okay. but um, all the projects that are there are very, very interesting projects. It's, uh, there are some very different ways we can, uh, we can go with our books. If uh, one project doesn't go through, we have another project. If the project does go through, the other project just shifts a year and then uh, we'll publish it a year later. But um, we have some plans and we're not knitted out at all. So like if you look back, right, and you think about that day when you walked into that yarn store, do you ever wonder like what would have happened if you didn't start knitting, like how your life would be today? Yeah, I, I realized that knitting and crocheting and doing yarn stuff is a very big part of my life now. And if I would never have gone to that yarn store, my life would be completely different now. I would have a music room instead of a yarn uh, room, instead of a craft room. Um, yeah, I, I don't think that my life would be worse or better, just very different. And not that's as colorful. Sure. Not that colorful, that's, that's uh, <laughs> for sure, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm so glad you stumbled on that yarn shop and I'm so glad you yeah, took this, uh, you know, hobby. And I loved having you on my show and I have, you know, loved chatting with you. Thank you so much for being my guest today. It was a, a pleasure and I uh, had a lot of fun. And uh, I hope a lot of people enjoyed our little talk. And 
And we're going to put all the information about how they can find you and your books and that little contraption as well. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks That's so a, much, Vin. A big thumbs up. You're very welcome. Hope to see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Oh.